Thank you for coming to episode 86. And for those of you who didn't come who are watching the archive, thanks for coming as well. I hope you can enjoy the show and not only that, learn a great deal about what's happening in Cyprus and at PwC. Back when I was a college student studying accounting, we called it Price Waterhouse. And then Cooper's is a separate company. And actually Price doesn't know this, they gave me a scholarship. So it was just a hundred dollars, but I did get a scholarship at UW Whitewater from, P from Price Waterhouse. So we have Maria Salamu with us today, and she's gonna talk to us about her journey and how she's ended up at PwC in the Experience Center there in episode 86, Harnessing Technology to Create Immersive uh, Experiences. There's a second student who studied with me at Indiana University, uh, Tiano Yurisamu, and she's got a little bit of laryngitis this morning. So she may pop in, she may pop out, we'll, we'll see. Um, Maria will cover both sides, um, what, what currently Tiano's working with and Maria as well. So you've got double duties here today, Maria. How about that? Sounds good. So in the Experience Center, they're working with face-to-face, -face, virtual, fully online, mobile, micro learning, gamification, uh, self-directed learning experiences, the whole gamut. In fact, I think uh, Tiana is a learning experience architect or learning experience designer. And maybe you can talk to us about what a learning experience designer is later on. But first, um, kind of tell us about this experience center that came on board I think at the top floor in the building you're in in Cyprus over the, you know, with a gorgeous view about nine months or maybe a year ago. Tell us what's happening there. Actually, yeah, um, it, it, we launched it in, the, in June, actually. And so we've been live and alive for the past five months. So uh, before we go ahead and start, may I say a huge thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be uh, sharing this time with you guys uh, today. So and, and very pleased to be sharing uh, my experience with you. Um, yeah, well, we're so honored to have you as well, Maria. And, and as an alum of our program at Indiana University, it's great to see you doing wonderful things there. And for those of you who know uh, Sasha Barab. Uh, she was Sasha Barab's uh, graduate student looking at Quest Atlantis for a couple of years and part that was her dissertation. And those of you might know Kylie Pepler at now at UC Irvine uh, studying creativity and participatory learning and digital textiles and all sorts of things. She was also Kylie's uh, graduate student and has published with her extensively as well. So Maria's got a rich background in this new era of active engaging experiences that she's brought with her from a K-12 setting to a corporate setting. So we can cover the wide gamut of, of questions and issues with you today. So thank you again for coming in here. She also knows quite a bit about Formula One racing, by the way. She's a gearhead on the <laughs> side. Uh, <laughs> so Mar Maria. It's true. It's true. <laughs> uh, great. Um, indeed, I've had great mentors. You, Kurt, Sasha, Kylie, Jim G. Um, so I'm grateful to everyone who have who have, you know, scaffolded my pathway to uh, uh, towards my PhD in the United States. So um, grateful to be where I am right now, enjoying a very creative um, um, work experience. Let me let me say I can never get bored at the Experience Center. So. Um, if I may just show really quickly um what the experience center is with a teaser let me just just start it So as I, I always like to say, the Experience Center is our playground uh, because as you see, it's a very creative, uh, high energy space. 
it really combines the the creativity uh, and rigor of an agency actually um, and also the the actual um, the the business orientation of, um, of of a consultancy so it's a hybrid model towards innovative um, solutions um, let me just say that as a, as an experience center, it's the first experience center in Cyprus and in the region, also in Greece as well, um, since we cover both uh, areas. It's the it's the space that combines um, a highly diverse um, set of activities, a diverse set of skill sets. Uh, we have a team of people with amazing skills from creative uh, technologies to um, uh, computer engineers are also communication and advertising uh, colleagues. So uh, as, a, as a team of, well, currently we're a team of four uh, and being supported by our business consulting colleagues, uh, we have a very diverse set of uh, skills so as a, as a space, the Experience Center combines all that along with the tools and the methodologies also to, to serve the clients that we have in the best possible ways. And, and, and by saying the best possible ways, I mean the most creative, innovative and immersive uh, ways. As an Experience Center, we belong to a network of 30 other um, 38 actually other experience centers globally and we are in close contact with them um, um, actually me and the director um, are in the experience uh, consulting leadership group that we meet frequently uh, globally to share cases um, talk about different uh, projects, opportunities, um, and, and ex experience consulting ideas. Uh, we are in close contact with our colleagues from all over Europe. Um, we, are, we have been fortunate in this COVID era to finally travel and meet them in person uh, just, just last uh, month. Uh, very creative um, projects they hold, they have, and um, Currently, we are very grateful and, and pleased and also proud to be starting our own big projects here um, in Cyprus, which we can talk later on. Uh, Chris has a, has a question. Well, don't let me interrupt. If, if you're in the middle of something, I can wait till the end. Well, maybe we can go ahead and uh, and start this. So uh, as I gave this uh, overview of the Experience Center, uh, maybe we can we can proceed to. Sure. Uh, the next did, you, did you have any slides you were going to show us, by the way, or was it just that video? Well, um, I had I have some slides maybe to to explain the methodology that we have and some workshops that we do currently uh, and how we approach those methods. Um, if if this is yeah. a good time to show yeah. them, um, you can go ahead. I think that would be good because it might help Chris frame his question. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so there we go. Um, just to say that we focus on experience, uh, creating the optimal experience for our clients and their customers. Um, that's why we focus on growth and we have to focus on accelerate business value on this. Um, and so the Experience Center has come to, um, to serve as a response to the market needs. Uh, we solve towards important problems, implementing sustainable solutions and inspiring innovations. Um, how do we do that? Well, we differentiate in the market by cultivating innovation, creating new user experiences, um, accelerating design and delivery uh, by trying to solve complex problems of all kinds. Uh, and then we humanize um, different uh, solutions. How we do that? We have the, our methodology, which is uh, BXT. It, uh, it stands for Be Excited. No, it stands for business experience and technology, but we are excited about it because that's the methodology that gave us um, great results over the past few years um, as, a, as a company. 
So the business aspect, uh, identifying the business value for the client or um, any, any type of value and how to grow together to accelerate that value. And then we create something memorable. What experience uh, are we going to build that people will love? And then we, we build those human-centric uh, experiences, thinking um, about everything, a holistic approach. And then we make it real. We use technology to operationalize um, everything. Um, so just to give an indication, our global results from the Experience Center's BXT method, Agile methodology uh, ha gives us a 34% increase in the return on experience, um, which is the re basically the return on investment that people um, invest in, and an 80% in increase in customer engagement which is very important for us to know that there is this huge, actually, um, statistic over there. And so how do we get the job done? Um, well, from anywhere, right? Um, we use different techniques, uh, and, and some of them, five of them, actually, I'm just uh, referencing here just to give an idea of the different workshops we do. Uh, reframing. We look at problems and potential, potential ideas through multiple lenses, so we can innovate and transcend uh, the challenges. Uh, we use the art of inquiry, storytelling. We adopt the growth mindset and then bold ideation. So let's see a few examples. Um, this is a, a, a couple of workshops we do on our interactive boards over there. Um, we have people ideating together, so, uh, solving towards specific challenges um, and looking at the different ideas through different lenses. lenses. Um, art of inquiry, right? We question the status quo. Um, we lead with curiosity, empathy, uh, mindful listening to forge lasting relationships, right? And this is an example you see here. Um, from a design thinking workshop that we uh, we ran with one of our huge clients, actually the la largest European financial institution, uh, who wanted to run and find innovative solutions for their uh, employees. Let's see. Oh, slow. There we go. We use storytelling in our narratives, right? We use narratives to capture bold thinking, uh, to spark curiosity and action in order to build connections with our users. Um, so we think beyond deliverables. Um, we see here um, one example of our uh, upcoming CEO just delivering through our hologram, uh, a, a keynote speech. You see me. Uh, walking away from my hologram over there uh, in a, in a CEO, presentation right? I was doing for the <laughs> Another uh, upcoming CEO, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. Well, I wish wishful thinking, right? Um, growth mindset, right? We shift the focus from doing better to becoming better. So we can outlast, right? And outperform ourselves, right? And of course the competition in general. Uh, this is an example of um, a leadership uh, training course I was delivering for leading hybrid teams actually. And the storytelling behind it was based on the Lord of the Rings. Uh, very successful uh, training that we delivered as PWC at the Experience Center. And we use bold ideation, right? Open up our minds. Uh, bigger ideas, we stay curious and find ways to uh, drive businesses uh, forward. Um, but if we have some time later on, we, we, I can show a couple of uh, videos as well. Um, so this as an introduction of uh, how we do the, the work, what I do and uh, how excited I am about it try and save a couple minutes at the end to show, have you show another video or two. If we don't get too, in, you know, too many, we, I got five questions. Chris has a bunch and, and Punya has a bunch too. So Chris, why don't you jump in here? So there is a long tradition of, of companies like PwC creating really interesting immersive experiences to kind of foster 
their clients' engagement, to get them involved in design thinking, to unleash creativity, and so on. Uh, for example, I remember the year that I came to uh, the Harvard Ed School uh, over 21 years ago, uh, one of the donors to the Ed School gave them uh, one of these experiences, which, which are expensive. And um, the whole faculty and leadership spent two days off campus in Boston in this special center that was physically immersive. And um, we, we went through many of the same things that Maria described, but it was all analog, right? So we worked with physical post-its and we uh, developed butcher paper, you know, concept maps and worked with whiteboards and uh, physical whiteboards and so on. And it's so interesting now to see that these are really hybrid experiences, that they're some physical and some virtual uh, and, and two different kinds of immersion then the physical immersion and the virtual immersion. So my question is, because I'm fascinated by this evolution in design, do, do, you, do you have a, a way of deciding which parts of this you keep physical and which, when you bring in the digital technologies and the immersive technologies, is there a kind of pattern that you've developed for this? That's a very interesting question, actually. Um, short answer is no. However, in order for me to be more detailed and fair to the question, um, we are very flexible into the ways we respond to the to the needs of our users. Um, that that's why I, I said no um, as a short answer. Um, so for let's take the example of our hologram. Um, we can pre-record some videos or some hologrammatic presentations, like the uh, the example I showed earlier of of myself and my hologram over there and have a pre-recorded uh, presentation uh, on stage. We can visualize our data live on the, on the hologram so that our users have a different kind of engagement with what is being presented. Um, and at the same time, we can live stream people on the hologram and present, so bring Chris Didi uh, from Boston on our hologram in Cyprus and presenting live streaming. And all you would need is a camera, maybe from your cell phone, even from your cell phone, since we have so uh, good cell phones uh, lately, um, a good internet connection and good lighting. And that's it. You are streamed, you're directly into our stage and, and present. So we are flexible in the ways we, um, we approach uh, events, workshops, solutions in general. In terms of our design thinking workshops, we are again agile in, 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 the, in the whole process. We do have the interactive boards uh, with you know, virtual sticky notes, but who can beat the actual paper, right? Um, so we also have um, papers and whiteboards so that we can serve all types of preferences. So yes, this hybrid actually works great. Um, however, we have clients, we have users in general uh, that might prefer one way or another. So at any time, we are flexible to serve um, those learning needs, those performance needs um, to the best of our abilities. So well, you, you highlighted something that, that is part of the new digital, which is that somebody doesn't have to physically come to the center to be part of the process or, or to help your team in facilitating the process. I'll say right here on the air that I would be happy to be part of a Lord of the Rings experience as long as I get to pick whether I'm Gandalf or Gollum in uh, what's <laughs> going on. All right, I'll, I'll give that option, definitely. I'll, I'll give the roles to pick to, to, the, to the participants. <laughs> you didn't know which one he picked, though. <laughs> well, um, actually, uh, that was a gamified workshop. 
um, on uh, leadership and the teams were the dwarves, the elves, the men and the orcs. So uh, a team leadership, um, so it was very, very good. <laughs> it, was, it was good, but I can give individual roles too. We'll have to do a role play silver lining for learning episode where each of the four of us picks a different species <laughs> to be continued at some point in the future. Actually. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not sure I like this trend of beaming people over because one of the perks of my job used to be I used to get invited to give talks in different countries. And now everybody's like, oh, just come on Zoom. And I'm like, no, I want to be in South Africa. I want to be in Cyprus. I don't want to be beamed into Cyprus. But, you know, well, that's yeah, then we will have you over in, in physical settings. Definitely. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm going out of focus here. Okay, that's better. My video camera doesn't like me sometimes. Um, so that's another reason, right? To be there in the flesh. But um, so um, I have a couple of questions. Chris, are you done with your thread? Can I jump in? Please jump in. Okay. Um, so, and they're sort of very different from each other. So let me just start with the first one and I'll come back to the other one. So one is, can you give some example projects that you have done, uh, particularly which have, because this is, you know, Primarily, our focus is on education and learning, um, ones which are connected in that space. Um, so, you know, but but I think articulating learning very broadly doesn't mean schooling, doesn't necessarily mean a classroom. Uh, it could be learning in a corporate setting, or it could be learning in some other setting, and that's fine. So, can you give some example? Because it, it's, I I sort of get the the design thinking process. I get all of that. You know, we do that here as well. Um, but I want to understand what some of these projects sort of look like and you know, so on. Um, for this, um, I wish Tiana was with us and she, um, cause she's the uh, e-learning instructional design professional down in the business consulting uh, team. Um, however, uh, we work closely uh, with Tiana. Um, one of the projects uh, that we have is with one of uh, a financial institution. And they, they have asked us to create uh, an innovative course, an e-learning e course um, on um, ways of enhancing teamwork, collaboration and learning about the latest financial um, compliance uh, rules. And so Theano and her team created um, an e-learning course who that was based on different islands. So you you would do island hopping and play a, a few missions, uh, solve a few problems with your team, um, and reach you know the final final island um, uh, as as completing your uh, your missions. Um, another example is for. Um, a European financial institution that has requested that we build a virtual escape room uh, for teamwork, uh, especially for teamwork. Uh, their goal is to um, enable their teams to learn together. So team managers and the team uh, members would solve financially related uh, riddles to go um, to climb a mountain. So we are creating a virtual escape room uh, in order to enable the, the teams to, to solve those uh, problems and reach their destination. It's facilitator-led, this one, this last one I was uh, mentioning. Um, another project that we are so, uh, about to start, no, can actually. I, can uh, I ask a question about the, the virtual escape room? Um, so if it's virtual, I mean, how are people, I mean, are they avatars in that space or are they wearing whatever Oculus kind things or are they doing it on the computer? I mean, what is the technology being used there? Um, at, at this, in this, ver in this uh, project, we have two versions. One is an e-learning, like articulate storyline oriented um, uh, e-learning uh, part. And then, because we have the, our, virtual island actually uh, at, as PwC we 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 build 3d immersive experiences so uh, if they choose to uh, people can log into the virtual island and run around with their avatars and find and open those chests and 
just play um, play around. So Thank that's you. also an option. And then a third option is the virtual reality scenarios uh, through virtual reality glasses. We have Pico and we have Oculus Quest 2 that we built the virtual scenarios uh, from that as well. Um, currently, we have projects um, with virtual reality on cybersecurity and on leadership management. So people can log in and learn about what cybersecurity is, uh, benefits, how to deal with cybersecurity issues. And we also have um, uh, scenarios that we play offense and defense scenarios so that people uh, practice their response uh, towards that, um, towards keeping safe, basically. Okay, so that leads, I think, to sort of a follow-up question to this. Oh, Punia, can you please repeat? I couldn't hear you. Okay. You're, you're, you're broken. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that leads to my follow-up question from there, which is broadly, what do you see as the, like the pluses and minuses of these tools and technologies for immersive learning? Because part of me is thinking Cyprus is such a beautiful island. I want to go to Cyprus to be in the real island. What's the benefits of having a virtual island when you're already in a real island? You know what I mean? And so, again, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of being silly here, right? We're facetious to a certain extent. But I think the bigger point for us to think about, especially those of you who are working in that space. And then Chris, I would love to hear your thoughts as well, because you've done, I think, quite a bit around the ecological space uh, with some of this. Um, so what do you see are the sort of the benefits and what do we lose, you know, in everything that we think about, even if we think about going from orality to print, I mean, you gain something, you lose something, right? And, and, and that's just the nature and it's not saying one is better or worse than the other. Um, so I'm just curious to think about based on your experiences, what you have noticed that you're gaining and what you're losing as well, right? And Chris, I would love to hear your thoughts uh, after. It's a, a great question, and thanks for asking this. Uh, it, it's been a topic of discussion for me and, and the colleagues. Um, what do we gain? What do we lose in each case? Um, and of course, I have to say that to me, um, everything is a trade-off, right? So if we build a virtual reality experience, it's a trade-off for something else. Right, so whereas we can, um, uh, yes, Chris, thanks. Uh, whereas we can um, bridge the gap of time, bridge the gap of space and bring people together from anywhere um, into a virtual space, for example, a virtual island and walk around with our avatars and leave everything through our virtual reality glasses and since we live, we experience everything here in our brain when it, when it comes to virtual reality, um, at the same time, we miss the physical presence, right? The physical reactions. Um, even though body language is understood, you know, in, in virtual settings, it's still a different kind of engagement when we have the physical face-to-face uh, -face settings. Um, and a lot of people uh, are asking us to organize workshops with them uh, physical in physical settings. Um, so that's the, that's the trade-off. So whereas we can bridge the gap as, as we are doing now and we are very nicely meeting uh, in virtual settings, I would, pre I would prefer to have to be in a, in a room, in a physical space, in a round table with um, all of you to have this great discussion and maybe with a cup of coffee. So, you know, nothing beats that physical interaction. Um, I'll just say something quickly and then I'd like to toss it to Kurt. And before we end, I wanna come back and talk about scale. But the quick response is that one of the ways to foster creativity is to make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. And I think the digital environments really offer some very interesting ways of doing that. And then maybe once you've got people in that space, that framing where the strange is familiar and they've, they've abandoned the familiar, 
then you can pull them back into a more familiar environment without breaking the spell. Thank you, Chris. I, I love that because one of the things yeah. that I've um, actually, I think I've written about it somewhere in the creativity, you know, about teaching actually, that teaching really is about that, is about making, taking the familiar and making it strange. You know, we look at a rainbow and we think, yeah, we've seen a rainbow and it says, no, actually it is light that is being, you know, uh, refracted through droplets of water. And then you take something strange like the rings of Saturn and say, oh, gravity explains it. You know what, the same gravity that works here. And the analogy I've used, uh, you know, we know the sense of deja vu and there is this other flip side of it, which is the veja du. You know, so the deja vu is where you see something and you feel that place that you have had that experience before. And veja du is the flip of that, where you see something familiar and it seems weird. And so I've often talked about teaching that way. So I, and I hadn't thought of that, that, you know, that these virtual experiences can actually flip the switch in your head in some way. Um, and and I, I love that. So thank you for sharing that. Kurt. Even better with debate wrapped around, it can really switch your gears, yeah. A, a few years back, I went to New Zealand. We, they took us to, uh, to Hobbiton and uh, they had a great debate where I was Gandalf the Grey. Uh, unfortunately, I lost the debate to uh, Peg Ertmer's team at, from Purdue. She was, she was uh, heading the other debate team. I was un unfortunate, but still, I, I might have part of that suit remaining. I could dress up one of these weeks. You know, I, I, I always, Think about the show from the standpoint of the students who might watch the show later. And, you know, I, I, I'm often kind of wanting to ask you, what was the one thing that led to this place? And, and this headset, maybe you can hear me better. Uh, I don't know if there's a big difference or not, but there's a difference in my hearing. Here. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose it a couple different ways. You know, because I came from the business world, and I often tell people that I, you know I'm at the intersection of business, education, psychology, and technology. That's what, but you know when I rethink, you know I'm really studying higher ed and K twelve, and I was doing military stuff and business. So I don't know if it's business, education, psychology, and technology. It's what you did at Bristol for your master's thesis. You know, you had at Bristol your education, technology, society. And then if you put a fourth hub on what you're doing, it's learning. And so I, I, maybe I need to reframe how I think about what I'm doing with, with the kind of the things that you've been doing. And, um, you know, I'd like, because people don't know that after she got her PhD, about six or seven years ago now, she decided to get an MBA. And so, you know, while working full time, <laughs> you know, uh, Maria is just, she doesn't sleep, I think. Um, so there's people who can say, well, Maria's doing cool stuff. I want to do, I want to be like Maria, right? Well, you can write to her or emails listed in the blog post, but she can also get some advice now. Could you tell people about your career path that led to where you are uh, and the job that you have? And could you also, as part two of this question, talk about what Atheano does in terms of what's a learning experience designer do? Because increasingly I'm seeing positions in the field ask for that or mention that. And so what is your specific title and, and what can you talk about what led, led that way? And can you give us a bit about what, what Theano's uh, doing in, as a learning experience designer to help the future viewers of this program? Definitely. Um, I have to say this is more than one question, so I'll try to remember to go to go through everything. If I forget one, please please repeat. There's um, a test at the end. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to start from uh, the work that Tiano is um, is actually doing. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to be with us due to um, some illness um, of the day, for the of these days. Um, what a what a learning designer does is is creating learning paths learning experiences if we may say uh, based on the objectives that are set and on, on the goals that we want our learners to to achieve so having had um, ha having done a first initial assessment of who our audiences uh, uh, our audience is, who the participants are, what personalization needs they might have. Um, we set the goals 
for a learning experience. We identify the different uh, trajectories that the, the users will follow and uh, because we also take care of, uh, we also take into consideration the aspect of personalization of learning. So we design the different activities in a way that are relatable to the user, right? We, we, don't, we don't do abstract learning. It's always uh, related to contextualize and, uh, and narratize as well in, in a way that uh, people can relate with it so that they can perform better in that learning experience. Um, so we developed that, that experience, whether that's in um, an e-learning course uh, or a virtual reality course or even a physical space. Um, and, and we measure the achievements, those mi milestones along the way. Um, and the important thing is to enable our users to transfer the knowledge and the skills they have acquired or they have developed to their own settings, to their own context, to their own environments, whether that's work uh, or life in general. So a learning architect is it, it's the architect who does the lifelong skills development, the lifelong knowledge building for, uh, for everyone. So setting up the space, the context, the content, and also positioning the person in ways that they're active um, so that we can achieve um, the learning goals. So th that's pretty much in a nutshell uh, what we do as learning architects um, uh, in, in general. So feel free to ask any, any questions or just post in the, in the chat any, uh, any questions you might have or even contact oh. um, me and Teano later on. Yeah, so, so you've not only been in a business setting, people again watching or people currently watching, uh, Maria's, was it the University of Cyprus? Or um, what was the, there's a couple of different universities you were teaching for in Cyprus, as well as working yes. at, so what was the name of the universities in Cyprus you've worked at? Um, I was teaching in the master's um, uh, the program of the Cyprus University of Technology. I was um, uh, teaching a course on computer games and communication. And then I was uh, online instructor at the University of Nicosia, which is a private university um, uh, course, master's courses on e-learning design, mobile technologies, um, uh, creativity, um, and innovation with so, technologies. So Maria's yeah. had this uh, cor uh, corporate experience, but as well higher ed, as well K-12 with the Quest Atlantis projects with all the things with Kylie Pepler. So you're well-rounded. And when you're working with Kylie Pepler, you got it particular into um, creativity and participatory learning. In fact, if you if you read anything from Kylie Pepler, you'll see another name, Salamu. It says Pepler and Salamu. So this is the Salamu that you're reading about if you've read some of Kylie's work. Um, and, and, and I think that is really where the entire field has been moving into contributory participatory learning as the web has offered us opportunities to have people contribute and not just receive education, not just a transmissive model. And so you've been in the thick of it. And I'm not sure to what degree the corporate uh, personnel are um, buying into a more active and engaging environment. What I see with the brainstorming tools that you're using, whether it's Padlet or Jamboard or some other technologies or mind mapping, it seems like, and from reading your chapter in my book coming up, it seems like you're getting people to be taking on different roles and different perspectives when they're going to training than they had in the past. They're seeing that their contributions are now listened to. Um, they're, they're not only listened to, they're being operationalized because you're not just delivering training, you're having people come to these training centers and participate in the training itself to contribute what they want the organization to be in the future. And you're doing that through active engagement of the learners and open-endedness and giving them some ownership. So they're not just there for a day and then they're, they're getting stamped. They're no longer there for the stamp. They're there for change 
and change management. Um, so that links a bit to what Chris is going to say in question, but I'd like you to respond to, to what I've said first and then Chris jump in here. Yeah, I mean, yes, of course, creative, I, I consider creativity to be core to what we do as professionals in any, in any aspect. So uh, my work with Kylie Pepler um, in the Quest Atlantis project was very illuminating for me, uh, coming to understand, you know, and, and research that creativity is not here creativity lies also in the context. So you have collaborative creativity, enabling people to interact and through those interactions, build upon each other's ideas and being able to come to new um, solutions. So um, throughout the years, I've come to transfer this aspect of creative, bouncing between creative and critical thinking. So to modes we are switching between. Um, and so even though the, the experience center is a, is a place where we do workshops to find business solution, not to train people. We come to apply these notions of creative and critical thinking to enable this growth mindset and enable people to um, unleash that creativity and, and, and think outside the box. And so we enable them with different techniques. So picture association, so bold words and uh, uh, finding or role playing, playing, what would I do if I was thinking as a Google or as a doctor or, or as a lawyer for this specific um, solution. So factoring in creativity into what we do, I find it a very uh, valuable thing. It, it, it's something that the world in general needs. You know what I mean? It's um, uh, I think it's crazy to be doing the same thing over and over again and expect to be progressing. So creativity is like our, our path to, towards finding and innovating um, in, in, the, in the world. So Chris is gonna jump in here and Punya is gonna ask the question that I, I was gonna end with. He's, he's, I'll let those two uh, ask them. And maybe if we have time at the very end, I'll have you show one last video clip before we go. So Chris, then Punya. So I'm thinking about our viewership and uh, some of them may well be from um, businesses or corporations who would say, wow, I think I'm gonna set up a, a PwC experience, but most of them, um, that would be out of their price range, frankly. Um, so I'm wondering, suppose that I'm a high school teacher or even a middle school teacher and I think, wow, I would really like my kids to learn these skills. And um, that could be transformational in terms of how they view themselves and in terms of uh, how, how they see the power of active collaborative learning and so on. Um, and you've got your five stages. So is, is there kind of a, uh, a light beer version or a budget version of of the process that we can imagine being used with both with younger people and in low resource settings that wouldn't be the same, but that would have value. Absolutely, Chris, yes. Um, and it's a great question and thanks for giving me a pass for this. Um, part of our mission is also to enable the ecosystem to transform itself, right? Um, so, one of the part of the activities that we do is to sponsor and mentor startups, young kids, young students into following STEAM professions, uh, developing this entrepreneurial uh, mindset. <clears throat> so yes, um, I, I have to say that yes, many people think that, you know, it's, PWC's experience center, it must be a high price um, um, uh, activity or engagement to, uh, to do there. However, um, we are not exclusive, right? We don't exclude, well, we're not exclusive of anyone. We are inclusive. What does that mean? Um, we do, um, part of our, our CSR um, is mentoring startups, mentoring juniors. We have the junior achievement uh, here in Cyprus that we sponsor as well. And we mentor students for that. 
However, we also work with smaller companies. So when a client comes and says, I have this small amount of money, but I want to start transforming my company, um, we work with them. We develop a business plan or a, a trajectory or a plan in general to grow together with them. Um, we want to enable companies to, to transform and to, and to develop. So as the, as the government's goal at this point is to, um, to transform Cyprus as a technological hub in the area, um, we come into play in, in, in that sense that we are enabling smaller or larger clients to transform uh, towards that direction. So small budget, larger budget, budget, it doesn't matter. We grow together and we might reinvest the money, uh, the earnings or the revenues or the profits, anything we, to, to, towards that growth. So we see that throughout time with the client. Um, does that make sense? And also with the with with young uh, with young people, we do a lot of coaching and, and mentoring. Um, definitely because we want to we want to spark the future of uh, of work in the STEM in the STEAM actually um, uh, area. So Maria, are you coming from the office or from home? Uh, today uh, from home. It's it's okay. a Saturday evening, and there is work done. Like there is um some fixes in the in the space oh, okay. for the next week so, i was yeah. going to see if you could show us the the uh out, the, the window view that you showed me uh because it's gorgeous uh but punya's gonna have a question and and then after that if we have a few minutes i'll i'll have you queue up another video and, and then uh to to maybe give us a better sense of what's going on so punya so um, the question is over there right now but i just was curious about how you see i mean you, you're pretty new um, in, you know, like a year old, I think you said in the beginning, right? As an experience center, yes. Yeah. Yes, so so, we, we set it up a year ago and we launched um, five months ago. Um, but okay. so as an establishment then, in Cyprus, yes, it's new. So, I mean, that must have been crazy doing it in the middle of a global pandemic. So congrats for, for doing, for achieving that, right? Um, so I'm just curious to, to hear from you. And we've already, I think, touched on some of in your previous response to the question, uh, but what do you see the role of this going forward? I mean, if let's say all of your dreams would come true, what would this look like, you know, five years from now or something like that? Uh, interesting. Um, I, I would see it more towards um, developing human oriented solution humanized uh, solution um, with technology so um, but human oriented creating an experience that is truly user centric um, and and creating those memorable experiences for students um, employees customers anyone um, I, I find uh, a great value into uh, designing towards that um, towards that aspect. So um, I wish and I think that in five years we will have established uh, a, a well um, a, a good trajectory, a, a well set trajectory towards that direction. Uh, given that. Um, uh, just upon our kickoff, we won a huge project on redesigning the user experience for our national telecommunication provider. Um, so in, in the next couple of years, the telecommunication experience for the customers and for the employees, it's going to be more humanized, more um, uh, user centric, uh, actually. Um, I am very hopeful that in, in the next few years, so five, as you said, um, we are going to be creating solutions, technology enabled, but human centered. So um, I'm gonna push a little bit here and because I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this. So there are two aspects to the user centered perspective especially in a corporate 
context that I wonder about. So one is, especially when it comes to new, new technologies, like Steve Jobs is to famously say that I don't care about focus groups because they don't know what they want. You know, so the idea being that when you're coming to new technology and the potential that users really don't know what this can be, right? So hearing from them might actually lead you astray. And there are examples we can, we can talk about. So uh, that's one. The second actually bothers me more in the sense that when I look at products like Facebook or you know a lot of these like Instagram and YouTube and so on, with the claim of being user centric, they have taken what I would call morally very complicated decisions. And I wonder about that as well, because Facebook can always say, oh, we are just giving users what they want. And YouTube can say, we are giving users what they want. And guess what? They want more rabid, extreme content because they're going to spend hours watching mm -hmm. that, right? And so I'm wondering whether these kinds of issues come to play in how you're thinking. So one is that users may not know what they want. And the other is that sometimes giving users what they want in, 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 itself, in and of itself uh, might be problematic, that, that there are broader ethical and moral concerns here, uh, so concerns that we need to be thinking about. I wonder if these kinds of issues have come up in your discussions at all. They have, they have, yes, indeed. Um, for the first part, uh, yes, I, I, I can vouch that 99% of the time users don't know what they want. And it's only natural, right? Um, I find value in interviewing and having those focus groups, even though if even though the the client doesn't know or the user in general doesn't know what they want, and it's not their job to know what they want. It's our job to give them to serve that need as as professionals. So um, the value I find for um, into you know focus groups interviewing is to identifying perceptions, emotions, habits of the users, because those are going to come into play later on um, when we are designing their as is journey of an experience, let's say, and identify those pain points that they have. And from there on, it's our job to give them something that is serving that need. So they will know what they want if it's creating or they will identify what they want if it's creating a, a, a truly delightful experience for them or a, a memorable experience or a pleasant feeling. Um, so that, that's kind of my take uh, towards that. I, I find value in, in, in mm -hmm. that uh, kind of uh, research as well. Um, in terms of you know, data, and I, I assume you're also referring to GDPR maybe, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I think that the, the context in Europe is quite different. And now we have the new rules that are coming out of Great Britain, which I think are quite amazing in terms of protecting children from these things. And in the US, it's a wild, wild west free market, right? I mean, open, open season, right? So I'm just curious about how those things play out in your thinking, because I think these are really important issues that we have not, at least in the US, given it the due consideration, either in terms of policy or in terms of just companies thinking, like reflecting on their own yeah. um, uh, responsibilities to the world. I think it's in the nature of every professional organization or in every, uh, even big four, since since we are talking at that level, um, they're, they're always um, compliant with this, with this kind of matter. So, we are risk averse as uh, as an organization in general and most or, m all companies are in that sense so there's always compliance with the european standards for that and in every solution that we design and we create um, users they will have to either opt in with their for their data or um, will be kept anonymous uh, now, in terms of social media, that's a different um, that's a different you know uh, approach because it's it's not up to us as users. We always opt in, and it's an at an individual level, you know. 
Um, and so in, in the case that we are, for example, creating an, an experience in, in a virtual uh, reality uh, context, um, we always have the consent of, uh, of the participants. And in the case that there is an open and live uh, event, there should always be uh, consent for rec video recording and, and also, so we always take care of, 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 this, uh, of these matters in that sense. Thank you. Now with the metaverse, let's see how it's gonna flow. So let's see. <laughs> so we only have about three minutes before I need to introduce the next show. Do you have a one minute video clip to show us or a two minute clip or, 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 um, or not? Yeah, I had a few um, mainly of uh, the space, uh, but yeah. I've shown Please them, show us uh, the space. Just just give us a, a, a quick minute view. I know it won't show all of it, but, but it will show some of it. All right, let me just, um, just uh, show. Uh, this part actually. All right, let me just share my screen. Share your screen. Yep. I like to show this video because it's one of the early uh, videos that we got. This does not exist here, but this is the view. Um, just uh, up. This is actually the the view, we have couches over here right now. Um, this is our theater, the theater space over here. Um, and here is our breakout room, which is actually the workshops area uh, over here with interactive screens and stations. Uh, and this is the, oops, sorry again. This is the hologram space. I was going to ask about uh, the hologram space. space. Yeah, OK. This is the stage, actually, here. Yeah. Um, this is our sandbox room. And it's kind of, there we go. Um, and as an open space, this is how it looks. Uh, we have the bar area over there. And we're, let's go to the immersion room, uh, which is uh, a room for prototyping and testing different products. Uh, let's see. So we have the presidential palace down there. Um, so this is an open room. It doesn't look at all like this uh, right now. Uh, actually, there is work being done, so I couldn't, I couldn't show the current state right now. Um, so we have uh, high tables and we have a lot more technology um, than what exists, what shows right now. We have sound showers that you can only hear on and if you stand below it. Um, so this is moved to a different place actually. So uh, I'd be very um, happy to show. <clears throat> happy to uh, show us here. live when we come visit right okay i'm glad to hear it that's a you've just i hope to plan uh, let's uh, let's plan a lot, another early um early conference uh, here in cyprus we used to we had so much fun organizing early here in in cyprus a few years ago so if you don't so, know if yes. your listeners here your early is the european association for research on learning and instruction it's the European version of AERA of smaller scale, and it's every other year. It's a fantastic conference, actually. And Maria was involved as a, I think, just a final year graduate student or just had graduated, got the early career people uh, track. Uh, I think you were led, right? Something like that. And so. Yes, and I was the president of the junior researchers of the uh, uh, early conference. So we were organizing the junior uh, um, conference as well. That's right, that's right. I, I was gonna ask a final question about um, giving people who are watching this uh, advice about K-12 higher ed or corporate environments, the benefits and 
and, and what you see as opportunities. But I, we're about out of time. So I, I just want to say, please write to Maria if you have questions related to the different positions that she's talked about, because they're all exciting and they're all emerging. And there's going to be more increasing opportunities within all these fields. And, and so it's exciting to see s- such success uh, of one of our alums, but of anyone within the field taking a very leadership role and changing a community, which you've done there. And you're going to continue to do as we move away from the pandemic and we can have more live meetings in the Experience Center uh, there or other places around the world. Uh, so thank you very much, Maria, for coming in this week. Uh, final, it's final. A pleasure. Thanks for having Sure. Yeah. It's, thank you for, for having me over. Um, I, I love the discussion and thanks for the questions. Um, I, I've actually come to, to remember, you know, some flashbacks from, from our, my, my past. So it was, it was great memories, great seeing you all as well. Um, and definitely looking forward to sharing even more experiences with, uh, with you, um, whoever is watching um, as well. And feel free to, you know, um, send over an email, a, a Facebook, a LinkedIn message. Feel free. I'll be happy to, to we'll, jump on yeah. and, and have a we'll, conversation. We'll do that next week. We're going to have uh, Balaji and, oh, I can't pronounce the last name, Balaji and TV. Uh, Balaji from the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver or Burnaby, uh, British Columbia. And, um, uh, TV Prampikar from uh, India, uh, the IIT of Kanpur, will talk about uh, MOOCs for development and they'll get at issues of innovation, access, low cost access to technology so farmers can uh, grow their crops and sell them and the ease of, ease of use issues. So it'd be an interesting session there. They've run 16 MOOCs or so helping farmers in India and Africa uh, become more productive. It'll be kind of fun. It'll be at the same time, 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. So I hope to see you then for the next episode 87. Thank you.